David King. What a what a joyous day to gather. Unbelievable weekend, G. Uh, great to be here this morning. I'll tell you what, what's those games back yesterday? A bit of behind the goal stuff to just sort of keep the juices flowing. We didn't have to do a first crack this week, so it was a bit the stress was off and just could enjoy footy for the the, the pure game that it was. Uh, just just some unbelievable performances, both team and, and individuals. Uh, and, and we'll get struck, we'll dive into that, there's no doubt. But I just want to start. I just want to start with whose best was best. So this is the King's Gambit. Yeah. So that we, the, in my opinion, these were probably the five, four or five best performances for the weekend. So these are players rather than teams. Players rather than teams. I think you, you go next level as a player when you do it in a final. Lockie Neal carrying his, not carrying his team's a bit strong, but being the major reason why Chris Fagan gave him the biggest bear hug he could after the game. Lockie Neal's performance on, on Thursday night. Was it Oliver's performance on Friday night, was it Jeremy Cameron on Saturday afternoon? Was it Jordan Degoe in the same game, being able to um, keep Collingwood in the game? Was it Caleb Sarong uh, on, on Saturday night? Bontempelli crazy for the first sort of 40 minutes of that game, but then relatively calm. Um, Sarong fantastic. Wh- which performance was the best? You know, I think that it's really important we celebrate these guys mm. because we're being spoiled at the moment. For players that just separate games that are – and I made the comment that Lockie Neal was untag- – I think he's untaggable. I, I really do. Um, and I, I got hammered for that on on Friday morning with Kane. J- Jeremy Cameron, we talk all the time, you and I, about Jeremy Cameron. And I, I, maybe I, I'm overs on him. I get it. I get that I'm overs on him. But if you get that match up wrong, you bleed. And he was just freakish on the weekend. So let us know your thoughts. How do you see it? So Jeremy Cameron is, he's the archetypal MVP. So unfortunately in our AFL sphere, we just roll it all in together. So the best players are the best players are the best players. No, no. If you separate, if you go most valuable player as against fairest and best, Jeremy Cameron's the most valuable player in the competition and has been all season. And Lockie Neal's performance on Thursday night was one of the, it was one of the greats. It puts you in mind of Simon Black in, in a couple of those finals that he played so I thought they were the two for me. So can we go back before we go forward? So, so Geelong take the unbelievable risk of trading first, three first-round picks. They get two back, so it's not as big a cost. So let's just say it cost two first-round picks effectively. They, they take the, the huge risk as a football club to shake the foundations of what would have to be a rebuild at some point down the track. Now, they don't, no one wants to rebuild, right? So you want to maximise, you want to absolutely wring the rag dry on every opportunity you can. They, they've been in the, this window, this, I don't know what sort of window they've got down at Geelong, Jared. It's, like, it's more like a sliding door, their premiership window. It's huge. It's been there for 10 years. But th- they take the biggest risk as a club to go and get Jeremy Cameron. And we see that, that sort of bravery now, what that's doing. I mean, they don't win that game without him. I'll be honest with you, I reckon they kick five goals again. In, in, in a first week final without Cameron. He has 12 score involvements. He's the only reason that it worked forward of centre. The only reason. So there's headaches down there for Chris Scott today, despite getting the chocolates in an unbelievable game. But if Cameron's not there, so we talk about rec- off season recruiting, how brave are you? How ruthless is your football club? Um, what, what steps are you prepared to take? Are you, are you prepared to absolutely get it wrong and blow the joint up? Because you've traded three first round picks. So the Tim Kelly scenario in Western Australia, right, is exactly the same as the Jeremy Cameron discussion at Geelong. Except this this has worked big and the other the other probably hasn't. So you, you do go all in. You do put your chips in because the, this is the reward into a prelim. Rolling now health wise. He, he, he's two days off not playing through hamstring. The the, the twenty one day, you know, discussion. What if it's what if what if they don't have the first uh, week buy, or the buy in between the, the gap of the home and away, and the, he probably doesn't play. So like, the, the, it's, everything's on a fine on a knife's edge, you yep. know. So I, I just I'm just wrapped for the Geelong Football Club as a group. That, that it takes all parts. It's not just Chris Scott. It's not just Joel Selwood. It's just not Jeremy Cameron. It's it's all parts. But this this is it all coming together. I, I know we've talked a lot about that, but what a player. Make the case for for Caleb Sarong's game for us. Well, I just thought Sarong was the constant all game, um, particularly at stoppage. Like, I think he had ten clearances, or it was nine or ten clearances, and he was just it. It sort of wasn't even about numbers with Sarong. I'll get these numbers up in a sec, but 
It was so he's had thirty three, ten clearances, sixteen contested. He kicks a goal from stoppage, and just when they were they were really battling early, uh, I thought that he was one that just kept fighting the fight, and then he kicked that big stoppage goal. I think with ten minutes to go, it was still only a goal of difference. So the game was never it was never as easy as it looked. I, mean, I know they got jumped and led by I think it was close to forty points, but um, yeah, it's forty one. There you go, forty-one points. A big margin, isn't it? Yeah, it's it a, six six to one behind. It's a big margin. So to see them just chip away and, and grind away and, and keep turning, you know, keep the wheel turning. I, I thought Sarong was a major player in that. Um, you know, and, and I don't think we talk about him enough. I've compared him to a young Lockie Neal. I think he is exactly Lockie Neal of five years ago. That that that's the player that he, he reminds me of. So that was uh, that was an amazing performance in a different way to the others. So Lockie Neal's more in your face. He, he, we, they just couldn't. They just couldn't clamp Lockie Neal. And I, and I do think, you know, watching that game back again on on um, behind the goals and, and side vision, that I do think Damien Harbick tried some things. You know, he, he had Cochin go to him. He had Short go to him. He, he had Pickett go to him. He, he he did try. Now Prestia was trying to go to him before he he got banged up. Um, so I do think they tried a lot of different options, but he just destroyed every one of them. So in the end, you say, well, we, we can't stop him. We have to go head-to-head. Um, and and that, that is an unbelievable position for Chris Fagan to be in from his coaching box or his viewpoint saying, they can't stop this bloke. So they're now effectively trying – they're wasting a position in the midfield on a run with type that, that is having no effect. So the games of Short and Pig and all, they're all impacted. The, the offensive flow from those guys is impacted because you're trying to clamp Lockie Neal. So there are other flow and effects that we don't really speak about. But we didn't see Short at his best. We didn't see Pickett at his best because their, their head's in another space. Jesus, he's got another one. He's got another clearance. What do you have? How many clearances did he have? Was it 15? Yeah, 15 clearances. The, yep. world, the world record in finals is 16. So that's a huge day. So I, I, just, I just think sometimes we've got to stop and, and, and just appreciate what we've seen. And, and the, you'll have your own thoughts out there as well. So text them through. But you know, Luke Parker's coming in strong. Uh, Parker could, was in my group. Was he in your yep. group? Yep. I thought when the when the tone needed to be changed twice, he was the central figure in doing that. My, he had Robottom running shotgun. I thought Warner would be the player to go with Parker, but it was Robottom um, who sort of was his ally in what oh, they were doing. He's been good, Robottom. He has. Yeah. He has. He's a he's a he's a uh, He's a younger version of Parker. Same, same physical presence. Uh, same, the way they want to impose themselves. So the hitman, one of my good mates, the hitman, Jared, he made the comment to me on the weekend that this this was the greatest team effort performance you've ever seen. Sydney's. Sydney's. Yeah. If, if, I mean, it's very difficult to sit down and say these three players were the best for Sydney on the weekend. You could name ten, and they're all eight out of ten. No one was 10 out of 10 for Sydney. No one. But they had the, the sum of all parts. And, and and I think it's a great way to be. It's a great way to be because you, you really now just can't clamp one player. Okay, they went after Warner. They got the job done on Warner with Brayshaw. But outside of that, who do you tag now? Like Parker's been tagged for eight years. Hasn't really impacted his game greatly. You know, row bottom you're not going to tag. Papley was okay. It was brilliant in parts, but not really across the course of the game wasn't the difference. Franklin didn't touch it. He was, he, you couldn't stop watching him, but he didn't touch mm-hmm. it. Look, McCartan boys didn't really have the intercept games that you thought they were going to have. You know, Lloyd kicks a couple of goals from nowhere. You think, that's, he hasn't done that ever. So, look, there were so many different things happening. Yeah. I, you know, there's, there's so many ways to win games of footy. There's no one way. And I just thought Sydney's ability to do it as a group for 120 minutes was just fantastic. All right. So answer your own question. There's a good push for Stephen May and for Darcy Moore with their defensive efforts. Just nail your flag to a mast. Whose best was best? Well, I'm a bad judge because I'm, I'm already skewed on this, Jared. So you already know where I'm going. I, I think Jeremy Cameron, because I think they were gone without him and they weren't going to score. And the fallout this week, if Geelong had got rolled, would have been unbelievable. But then again, Lockie Neal, you can make the exact same points. I think those two were the standout two performances, and you can put them in whatever order you like. The art of coaching. We've just got the additional category today. So you were <laughs> coached by Dennis Pagan, David King. Yes. What do you hear in those words? 
I think it's great direction. At times like that, you, you just need someone to stand up and say something that gives you a bit of guidance. So I, I think it's great to not wallow in loss because you've you've got to pick yourself up and get on with it. So so he's right. So be disappointed, absolutely. You don't need to show the world you're hurting. It doesn't serve any purpose. Um, get back into the sheds, talk about it, relive it, evaluate it. Correct it, move on. That, that's what that's what he's about. Yeah, you know, celebrate when you win, and if you lose, work out why why that's the case, and then and then get on with it. They'll still celebrate the the position they they put themselves in. They played some great footy, and really they could have put the game to bed at quarter time. They just missed some opportunities that they'd taken the last few weeks, particularly in second halves. Um, they they had Geelong rattled big time. Geelong couldn't move the ball. They they dropped back into that slow brand of footy. That, that doesn't now suit them. Um, so that, that, it's a lost opportunity, but, you know, that's that's footy. So Craig McRae's 100% right. Hey, this is part of it. The top four play each other, and they generally wrap back around and, and, and flip sides of the draw and go again. So are you, are you good enough to get off the canvas as quick as you can, dust it off, move on? Okay, you lose a soldier in Taylor Adams. That's a big loss. And health's your best player at this time of year. But let's not wallow in loss. Let's just get on with it. I think it's great guidance. You, you need it as a player, don't, don't you think? No, well, you've lived it. I, yeah. I haven't. Well, Dennis gave us a lot of guidance. Yeah, too. that was. This is. <laughs> he was the man who came to mind. A lot of guidance. Must admit. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's this. You know, it's it's hard for players who invest so much at that when that siren goes to be so close. Um, yeah, a moment here, a moment there, and, and you're, you're on the other side of the coin. So you, you just need someone to take control, and Craig McRae's done that in a way that he's not really talking about kicks, marks, and handballs or your role or anything like that. Just your just, just, just state of mind. It'll be positive down there at Collingwood today. Mm. That's the difference. He, he, he's creating everything. He's creating an environment that promotes winning. What, what a great space to live in. David texts through, my top five moments across the four games. I don't know whether David's put these in order or there are five. So one, Lockie Neal's game. Mm. Two, Robbie Fox's smother and tackle. Three, Jeremy Cameron goal from the boundary line. <laughs> Four, Frederick's tackle in the uh, in the last quarter. And five, Lynch goal being overturned. And you could add five more to those. That's oh. how good the quality of it all was. I thought, I thought of you when that banana was paid a goal and then we went upstairs and I thought, oh, this is Jared. It's been this 10 years in the making, Matt. Wheelhouse. 10 years in the making. Oh. We have so many categories to work through from <laughs> the glorious opening rounds of the final series. The big issue, Geelong out Collingwood, Collingwood. Take the dive into how the Cats beat the Pies. Well... They were lucky. First quarter, they were all over them, Collingwood, weren't they? And I think when you look at um, – so this, this the, the commentary around this annoys me regarding the, you know, the build-up to the game. There are a hundred different ways to win a game of footy. There is no right or wrong way. There are all, all different mechanics going to it. No two teams play the same. So you will get a different game every time these two teams play, regardless of which two you want to pick. So on the profiling – you play this game 10 times, I think Geelong win eight, on, just on profile, okay? So there's still the two out of 10 that Collingwood can win. So to win it, they've got to do, they've got to do what? what? They've, got to, they've got to put enormous pressure on. They've got to be able to move the ball against Geelong, which is difficult to do. So the, 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 the things that Collingwood could control, such as pressure, and the fact that I thought they played really wide early. If you watch that game again, it's, it, all their, all their counterattack is, is three, four metres from the boundary line. And they put speed onto Geelong. Now we know Geelong are not a—they're not a, a great leg speed team. They've got some players in there that can travel, but in the main, they're, they're a pretty—they're they're a one-paced unit. Very experienced, old if you want to use that term. And they were exposed for lack of leg speed in that first term. Collingwood turned the ball over four times between the arcs in the first quarter. Now, the AFL average is about ten, so it doesn't sound like—it doesn't sound like a lot. But that's six less opportunities Geelong had with the ball on counterpunch, on, on intercept. So they were able to move the ball coast to coast. Some of the kick-out work was terrific by Collingwood, and, and they challenged Geelong immediately for leg speed. They couldn't handle it. They got it in deep, and then the Cats looked rattled and played slow footy. 
So that, that was it in a nutshell early. The breakaway speed from stoppage of guys like um, Pendlebury, Adams, Dugowie against Guthrie, Dangerfield and Atkins early was a real concern. I think Chris Scott would have been looking down thinking, we're, we're in trouble here. We can't go. We, we can't move like these guys are moving. So first quarter, the game, in my opinion, it should have been over. It should have been over and full credit to Collingwood for that. But then you flip and you say, okay, how are they still in it? And it keeps coming back to the individual matchup for me of how, and then at times more, versus Cameron. You get it wrong against Jeremy and you bleed. We've said that all year. If you haven't got a matchup for Jeremy Cameron, you're not holding the Premiership Cup aloft. And, and, and that's as simple as that for me. So he ends up with 17 disposals and he's involved in 12 of, of Geelong's 23 scores. Three goals too. Some of his kicking just ridiculous. The kick to Mitch, Mitch Duncan, you can talk about as much as you like. The kick to Gary Rowan at the end, the one where he fresh-aired the mark. Like even to pull that back to that area at that speed was just terrific. So <clears throat> in simple terms for me, Geelong, Geelong got rolling off the back of a, of a few of their stars uh, they've got some work to do. Nothing's ever perfect. I thought Zach Guthrie was terrific when things were ugly. He's in a set mark and his composure was 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 outstanding. Um, there are there are small things that just went wrong. So I'll put I'll put right down here on the notes. It's things like things that you don't talk about. So stoppage is inside Collingwood's forward half. So Stengel is a half forward flanker for Geelong rolls up to the back. He's he's likely to cover the wingman or 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 the the high half forward for the other team. So he's likely to come up and just be pressure. Let his man drop off a little bit. Not quite there. So instead of being four metres away, he's six metres away. Bang, Collingwood get an opportunity. Happened happened two or three times. I think Chris even kicked a goal from one of them. So the little things were just off for Geelong, and they but they got away with it through their experience and their their know how. Um, but looking back, I, I do think Collingwood had set this game up perfectly, and, and they will they will rue this. There's no doubt. Gary Rowan's interventions. He was terrific, wasn't he? Uh, look, he's been a player under enormous pressure. Um, the, the big pack mark everyone will talk about. I, I think he's 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 want to put pressure on the opposition is 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 always there, and that's what Chris got. I think that's why he gets selected. The rest is a bonus. His, his forward half pressure is is next level. Um, what, what did he kick in the end? He, kick, he kicked a couple, didn't he? Three. He, he kicked three, yeah. So, I mean, it's significant, isn't it? They, they've had so many good performers. I, I really think Max Holmes is going to be a superstar. He's going to be a star wingman. Even some of the composure that he showed stepping through traffic on occasion. Just the, he, he, something about players once they know how to use their speed in game. It's all well and good being quick. And you can get to a ball quickly, and you can you can operate quickly, but not really understand the full tools. It's come together quickly for Max. If you watch his some of his composure, say, I've got this guy for speed. I'll take him on a on a slalom run through traffic, in and out. That wing run, he, he kicked the goal. He put it to Josh Dacos late, the one that um, he got the handball in the square for. I think it was Stengel um, in the last quarter. It might have been the second last goal uh, where he where he charged. Or the third last guy. He he charged Dacos and him head to head, middle of the ground. Geelong win the ball. He's off and gone. So I I, I think that he's a, he's going to be an absolute star for the Cats. And and they're just they're just learning how they can use this guy. Right now he's a wingman, but I've got no doubt he'll become a prime on baller going forward. I thought Collingwood were enhanced in defeat, so they do have to go the long road and play the extra game, and it does put them on the road if they're good enough through Sydney. But I actually, and there's been a lot of focus. I'm not a numbers guy. That's your portfolio. I'm a spiritual guy. But there was actually, there was something more um, rock solid about their game. Some of their close wins have been a bit mystical. I thought their game was in great order, broadly speaking, on Saturday. Yeah. So, So all four finals, okay? So if you control Corridor, you win. Okay. People say, oh, that's way too simplistic, and it is, and a lot has to go into that. But the teams that had the higher volume of forward or inside 50 opportunities via corridor were the teams, all four teams won on the weekend. So Geelong had 110 corridor disposals, Collingwood 86, 20 inside 50s to 17, nine goals, 10 to six goals, three through the corridor. So that's Geelong of this year. So they weren't that early. They weren't that in the first quarter. 
but then they forced the game back into corridor. And Collingwood played really wide first quarter. They, for some reason, tried to bite off these corridor kicks. They were in a great position playing wide. And I think that they'll review that and say, why did we... Why did we take those risks bringing the ball back in? They didn't need to do that. They didn't need to force the issue because they'd been forcing the issue in the last quarters over the last month or so, or eight weeks or so. They didn't. They were in a different, a foreign position. They didn't need to chase the game. Yep. They needed to kill the clock. Not kill the clock's ridiculous in the second quarter or third quarter, but they didn't need to force the scoring issue because they had such a a, a buffer. Um, but that's 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 the way it is, isn't it? I, I think ultimately when you review. That last play, the, 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 the opportunity for Cameron to get it to Rowan to get it to Holmes in the square, what makes you strong also makes you vulnerable. Okay, so Jeremy Howe, he rolls off Cameron to come and spoil the ball back inside 50, the, the Blitzar's exit. Scores are level. So he's thinking, if I can drive a fist into this and give us another opportunity, then that's my role. That's my fuck. So he leaves Cameron. Pendlebury's by himself behind the ball. So he knows he's got Pendlebury behind him. All of a sudden now, the handball goes to Mitch Duncan, who, who, who's in a tackle, does the full 180, and then pops it back to, to Guthrie, I think. Okay. Now, Pendlebury, they're, they're, they're a come-at-your defence. So Pendlebury says, oh, I've got to go. Our, our, our system is to go at the ball carrier. So he comes forward. As soon as he comes forward, it's Maynard versus Rowan and Cameron. Horrible position to be in. You're gone. They die the way they die because that's the way Collingwood play and they would have got countless goals or opportunities to score from that across the course of the year. But on this given occasion, Geelong slipped the noose and scored. So whilst it, there's, there's ways you can lose, but that, that will more often give them a win than a loss. It'll look horrible on replay. Yep. And you know what? If we did first crack last night, it would have been the first bit of vision we yes. showed. Yep. Because that, that, in a nutshell, is the reason why they won the game in the end. But they were true to themselves. Collingwood, out Collingwooded by Geelong. <laughs> Preliminary final integrity. I thought the Swans' win was the best of the four. Where, where did you sit with the Swans' performance? Yeah, a great performance. I mean, we've been big on the Swans for a little while. Not oh, we, we. You. Oh, well, yeah, you actually. We'll get to yours later. <laughs> I can't be allowed to share yeah. in that. <laughs> yeah, I've sorry. been warned. It was just, I slipped there. <laughs> um, oh, there's no there's no bad wins in five. You know, the Cats win was a brilliant, a brilliant win. The Swans win, you know, I think that, uh, again, many different ways to win a game of footy. So Melbourne, we, we know Melbourne are brutal, and, and, they, and they're going to win contested possession. They won it by 25. So can, can you withstand that, knowing that that's coming, and then, and then play your game. Force your game onto Melbourne. Now, we showed vision on 360 last week of how Melbourne – sorry, how Sydney defend, and it's personal. It's 1v1, guard dangerous space. Get back to your man. Allocate a man. Jared, he's yours. That happened over the ground all game. And that was why Melbourne – they couldn't move the ball. They couldn't move the ball. We, we know about their scoring woes. We know about all that sort of stuff. But um, – they couldn't move the ball and then they couldn't – because they couldn't move the ball, it didn't matter how many times they won the ball back. Like Stephen May was winning the win the ball. Every time the ball went to Franklin, he'd be beaten by May. You know, Lever was doing his thing there for a while. We had Petty doing his thing there for a while. But it didn't matter. Because they couldn't move the ball, they scored three points from turnovers in the second half, Melbourne. Three points. Well, the AFL average is 50 points a game. So three – you just can't – you can't win when, that, when that's happening. So – they had 81 intercepts for the day, Melbourne. It's a huge number. That, that's a really big number. 54 between the arcs, which is only one off their season high. But for some reason, it's Sydney both times this year they couldn't move the ball against. So sometimes it's who you play, not, not how you're playing. Um, so a lot of Melbourne stuff looks really strong. It, you know, a lot of their numbers look, look, look really strong. So, you know, at half time, you, you know, Melbourne have taken nine intercept marks, Sydney have taken none. You think, yeah. yeah, okay, this is this is this is looking a bit like a Melbourne game, yeah. even though you know, don't worry about the scoreboard so much. Um, but then the, the, the Swans just seem to have more players that would that would have a five minute windows. You know, Papley had a window, then Parker had a window, then Reed had some significant. Mo they took Franklin off the ground. He was off for six minutes. I reckon Sydney scored three goals. And, and it's funny because May had Franklin absolutely covered. 
and he, he, he come with a clear plan to, 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 to body him at the right times, to go at the ball at the right times. And he is, he's a colossal figure, Stephen May. He, he's, he's, he's a brick with legs, isn't he? You can't yes. move him. He's like a walking bollard. But as soon as Sam Reid went to full forward, in that window we're talking about, I reckon he saw Franklin go and he went, oh, I've got him beat. He's got, they've taken him from the ground to have a chat to him. And Reid comes down there. Reid runs at the pack. May drops off. If it was Franklin, he would have been bodying him, denying him that opportunity, and then driving a fist into the pack or taking the mark. But because it was Reid and he just had that little emotional release, that little letdown period, Reid comes up, jumps over the pack, takes a mark, kicks a goal. And I reckon Sam May would, uh, Stephen May would have gone, oh, I didn't do anything. What, what am I doing? You know, just, they're just little moments in finals that, that just change the course of the game. So Oliver was fantastic. 29 disposals, 19 clearances, 10, cle- 10 uh, score involvements. Of his eight clearances, six of them finished inside 50 and three of them become goals. So, like, his presence is, is – he's ever-present. He's always, he's always involved and sometimes you just got to admire what these guys do. But in the end, the, the overall team effort from, from, from the Swans – I think exemplified by the one play where where Fox, I heard your call on replay, you know, Fox just doing you know the the basic Sydney thing, you know the blood's oath, um, just you just keep fronting up, you don't 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 think, just do, you know, and it, f- to be able to get a smother on at the end of that was just it just it just in the end said you know what this is Sydney's night, and then you extrapolate that, uh, their ga- their game is in. Preliminary final integrity order, isn't it? Well, it is, yeah, because it's what they do without the ball. So, you know, in the third quarter, Melbourne have 12 attempts with the ball, starting with the ball from defensive half. Now, I know Melbourne haven't been great with footy this year, and they're not a great ball movement team, but none of them go inside 50, and yet they cough it up five times. And uh, Sorry, they cough, coughed it up. They coughed it up coming out of their defensive half, and it cost them five goals in the third quarter, and you go, wow, that, that, is, that, that is being hard to play against. If there's one comment you want about your team, yeah. it's that we're difficult to play against or we're impossible to play against. And I think John Longmire, he gets this great talent in, and everyone can talk about the academy selections and all those sorts of things, but he, he turns great talent into great average players. And, and if, if their talent can take them higher and higher and higher, that's great, but you've got to play like an average player. You've got to get a goal side of your man. You've got to defend for your life. Or, or we we can't we can't have you in the midfield. Like Callum Mills has gone in the midfield and become a star factor midfielder, just doing the basics over and over and over again. I, I love the way they play. Um, it's old school. It's old school yep. finals footy. It's a throwback. It really is. Kingy, the pressure index falls to Melbourne uh, with the Christian Petrarca injury in particular. Yeah, the only thing we keep saying from the midpoint of the year on, is health's your best player. And they're in an awful set of circumstances, aren't they, really? Spargo with the with the throat slash voice box issue, which can be quite nasty. Yep. And no guarantee to get to the line this week, I wouldn't have thought, at this early stage. Um, you hope he does, because he actually played quite well, and some of his kicks inside 50 were brilliant. But Petrarch is the one. I mean, is it just a pain management issue? How much discomfort's there? What what does it take away from him? Does it does it take away his power? Does it take away the confidence in kicking? What about if he gets more contact on there? Do you actually play him? Do you take the risk of not playing him this week to win a prelim, or do you say no? We absolutely have to win this week, and he's he, he has to play. We saw it happen to Nathan Fife in twenty fifteen in a prelim, and whilst he still got possession, he's just not the same player. Um, and and Melbourne need. They need a match winner now more than ever, um, because how many players really for Melbourne were at their best on the on on Friday night? Well, you, you'd say May was brilliant, Oliver was out, outstanding. There's three, or four, there's two or three others, but there's not ten others. They're not batting as deep as what they used mm. to. The roles are not they're being sort of met, but they're not being done delivered in an outstanding fashion. Um, so. I, it's hard not to worry about Melbourne what the way they the, the way they're playing. It was a great game, and they still got their contest stuff going beautifully, and they're still able to defend to a point. Um, but because they can't score, that you feel like Melbourne are under pressure all game, every game. 
There's nothing easy for Mel at the moment. I don't know about Max going forward anymore. I watch it and I think, can, can they keep Max? Do they just need to throw him in the ruck? If Petrarca's banged up this week, does Max just need to go back and be a 70%, 80% ruckman and just dictate terms and become a, you know, not become, be that star factor player we know you are and dominate the game again? And I think that that's, that's something I'll be looking at because there's going to be an opportunity there this week with potentially against Darcy Ford or... You know, I don't know whether you go with McStay and Danaher again or you bring in Darcy Ford. It sounds like they're going to bring in Darcy Ford. But that, whatever it is, that hardly threatening to Max. The best bit was the reaction of Chris Fagan and the hugs and he was on the mic around the stadium. But now the task is, is this is a bad matchup for the Lions. We've seen it graphically this year, first at the MCG and then at the Gabba. What do they do to try to... Mm. To get something different in the matchup, never mind the result. Well, they, they've got to win a different way. So let's just let's just agree they're not going to win contested footy. Oh, there's no shame in that. Sydney got beaten by 25. So the reality is you're probably not going to win that area. So don't set the game up to win that area. Because if you do, you'll give up other luxuries that won't allow you to defend lost ball or won't allow you to score, even if you do win it, because you're invested so heavily at contested footy. So have... Have you, your assets invested somewhere else? So can you can you can you beat them on ball movement? Because if if, if you can set it up for a slingshot brand of footy, um, a different to the way the Swans do it, you know, may, maybe more in line with Collingwood. So defend hard, back fifty, maybe free up Harris Andrews, get him to be the loose man. You know, don't get beaten by by the fact that you are going to probably give up more inside fifties. Maybe have more punish on the way out. Zorko at half back, what, whatever it is. Whatever it is, but this is a real coaching test for me for for Chris Fagan and the, and the Lions match committee. Can they set the game up a different way because they've been beaten the same way the last couple of times? Now the numbers the last couple of times. So in round twenty three, so there's two different types of contested possession. There's pre clearance, which is when the traffic's at its greatest. Okay, so mano on mano, banging heads. Minus six in round 23, minus 11 in round 15. So that's pre-clearance. Then it gets to the outside. So these are the damaging ones. The contest on the outside, either continue your, your ball movement forward, win contest, win contest, score. If you lose it and you win it back, it saves you conceding. Okay, so minus four in round 23 and minus 27 in round 15. So to, to me, don't worry about the pre-clearance one. You, you're probably not going to be able to beat Oliver. You, you crank up Lockie Neal and you say, go yardest. But on the outside, set up so that you can defend lost ball because I think logic says you're going to lose more than you win at contest, particularly at clearance. So let's see what they set up. They're there. Credit to them for the performance the other day. I, I hope they stick with Darcy Wilmot. I thought he gave them some real energy and some real spark. Um, I, I don't know if I'd be rushing a Ruckman in. They got the most out of Daniel McStay that I've seen for, for, for a long, long, yes. long time. Uh, he, what do you have? He had 23 disposals, which is a PB. So the guy's played 160 games of footy, and he has a PB after being thrown into the ruck um, because of Big Oscar going down. It worked for Joe as well. The forward 50 targets, so it changed their forward 50 mix. It made them a lot smaller. Yep. And it worked because you know, Hipwood was targeted eight times. He kicked three goals. Charlie Cameron played a lot higher up the field and worked back towards goals. I thought he was absolutely sensational. He was only targeted five times. Now, when I think Brisbane fail is when there's a good matchup for Cameron, which there is with, with uh, Hibbert, and, and he, for some reason, seems to seems to just clamp Charlie every time. So don't get beaten the same way this time. Don't get beaten by what you know. Play him high, challenge him for speed on the way back. So, yeah, again, again, it's, it's going to come down to the stars. We know all that, but I just want to see what Chris Fagan can organise to make this game look different to the last two. The debate, Kingy, is the other side of Thursday night's result. Is Richmond going up or down? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, got to know where you are. you got to know you? where you're at in footy. And, and they clearly do because they know they've got some ageing stars that are now going to take less uh, financial control of the salary cap. So they, they've got some flexibility. We hear Tim Taranto will get to the big deal and he's a great acquisition for them. Um They've had to they've had to plan around players like Prestia that have have gone down regularly in game and in season. So they need they need some durable midfielders again, guys they know are going to be there uh, for 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 twenty matches a year. 
uh, if not 2023. 20, um, no, I, I'm still a massive rap for Richmond. I, I still think their system is, is, is the best in the competition. The amount of times you see a game look like a Richmond game is, I think, 80% of the time. Now, they still took, they still took 17 marks inside 50 on the weekend. 17 marks inside 50, nine goals, four. So Lynch took five, Jack Jack took four. Um, so that, that, that's, a, that's a huge number. So of their last 13 finals, only the grand final smashing against the GWS produced more marks inside 50 than what they did the other night. So that's a big number for Richmond uh, in, in a big game. Now I've got I've got enormous faith in that that football club just to get things right, regardless of whether the name tags still read, you know, Cochin, Rewalt, Martin. And we know Edwards is no longer there. We know Lambert's no longer there. We know there's a few that have that have that have moved on, but no, you, you just don't lose faith in in Richmond. So Richmond's bumper sticker for 2021 will read: "How did we lose that game on repeat?" For this year, it's a special category. Yeah, uh, yeah. They've got half a dozen. How did we lose that game? Yeah, it was. It's just such a strange game. It's just. I mean, it, they had opportunities. You, you just. I don't know. I don't know, Jared. I don't know about the goal reviews and a few things went against them, but they didn't. They just couldn't get a handle on one guy. It's as simple as that. They, they got Lockie kneeled. Outside of that, <laughs> it, things were pretty good, weren't they? Now, Lockie Neal, I think it was involved in uh, nine score involvements. Four of them were centre bounce goals. Mm. So it's very difficult at centre bounce to actually clamp a player. It's it's three on three at ground level for about eight seconds. Um, so we just you just have to you just have to trust Richmond. Luke Beveridge, in the aftermath of defeat in the West, a season over, a failed campaign. There have been fault lines in the Bulldogs all season. They opened in the West and swallowed them whole, Kingy. <laughs> they are they have lived the season in the category of the curiosity. Yeah, they have. And look, they've they've got a significant strength here, which we talk about every week with this midfield. And at quarter time, they're plus fifteen contested possessions for a quarter of football, in in conditions that that meant you had to put your nose over the footy. Um, they forced Fremantle in a constant error. Uh, Freo turned the ball over twenty five times first quarter. They're world record numbers. Um, the AFL average is close to 16 or 17, so 25 is a big number. And it was six goals to, to one point. You know, the, you thought the game was over, really. It was it was going to take something something uh, special for Fremantle to come back and win. And, and credit, full credit to them. They're the hardest ones to win, aren't they? Yeah. When you're on the canvas and, and you just find a way. And, you know, this, this, this was... Yeah, Bonson and Pelly was out of control early, and then and then you know I know he's he's been injury impacted over the last six weeks, but we're not here to make excuses for players. He was he was pretty quiet after that. Um, the repeat entries, uh, it was repeat entries all day. In those conditions, it was who could actually move the ball out of their back half to just not necessarily score, but to to control some territory. And then the same problems come home to roost. The dogs can't defend. They can't defend. And, and as much as they want to talk about it, there's a there's a mark that uh, the young fella, uh, Jai Amos, takes in the last quarter. Um, and it's about it's about three minutes into the quarter. So if you're watching the game back again, 17-27 it is. You, you, have to, you have to watch it three times to work out what's happened. Like, I don't understand why Ryan Gardner allows his direct opponent who he's standing next to at the top of the goal square to run 30 metres and take a chest mark, unopposed, inside forward 50. I, I look at it and say, oh, well, he must be handing over to someone. There must be someone there to assume control of a young, a young full forward. So so he's not really out reading him because the ball can't get to where he's standing, Gardner. Look, he's no chance of intercepting the play. So if he's if he's just got it wrong and he's, he's read that they're going one way, not the other, no problem. But he just chooses not to defend the full forward. And I think, what is that? Alex Keith looks a shadow of, of the player that we've seen over the, la- over the last few years. Yeah. Cordy, uh, Cordy does the same thing. He just makes mistake after mistake. I, I look at their back, their their key three defenders, and I think, what what is going on? Like, wh- where is this? So they got they got a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. And then, um, yeah, full credit to Fremantle for making them look poor and, and for that 
constant and consistent driving the ball inside forward 50. I think it was something like 52 inside 50s in the last three quarters of footy. So well well done to them for engaging in the fight. You know, Sarong, Brayshaw, the same names we talk about a fair bit. Um, I thought there was a big tackle made just before half time. It was Lockie Schultz on Caleb Daniel. And he, he didn't just run him down. He come flying in at, at, at an unbelievable speed and cut him in half. And I thought, well, there's a little statement. There's a little statement. And and, and things seemed to turn uh, from that moment onwards. So, you know, the dogs, they, they couldn't stick a tackle in the third quarter. You know, Fremantle walked through them. And then once they got on a roll, that was it. That, that, they, virtually, they virtually threw the towel in the dogs. Yeah. Really meek finish to their year. So they have they have a series of questions to ask themselves, which date back to how they handled the grand final loss, how they presented into the season, because there's no Harry hindsight in this. You could see the issues at the Bulldogs in their in the mental framing of the coach coming into the year, and it was there in round one. But they've had this this defensive systematic failure. All year. Mm. It's a long time to not identify it or not rectify it. And Beveridge spoke about uh, that the the, uh, strategic part was fine. It was the player application. I think we're entitled to get to the end of the year and go, nah, nah, you never solved the strategic part of it. Never mind the way. So why didn't they perform? That's the, that's 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 what they have to ask themselves coldly. Yeah. What, what was the source of this and how do we rectify it? Because I think going on the, she'll be all right. I don't think they'll do that. I think there's too many smart people at the club to go, no, we're on the right track without asking these pointed questions. So I, I, I love Bevo as a, as a motivator and as a coach, and I think he's terrific for our, for our, for our code, and I, I love talking with him. And he's had a strange relationship with the media this year. It hasn't, it hasn't been smooth, and we haven't really got much out of him, to be perfectly honest. We haven't heard from him, and he hasn't given us the little pearls of wisdom that he's given over the previous five or six years. We really haven't got this year. So it makes me think there's a bit of tension there. And then I think, okay, when, you, when you're not really – at the pointy edge of the strategic side of the game, what, 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 is is this a problem? Is it is it the intel in the coach's box, the support crew, that are maybe not giving you enough? Then I see the defensive plan, and and I have what, why didn't they try Josh Bruce down back? What, why haven't they had a look at Norton? I, I keep saying I keep saying something different. Show us something different, okay? Sam Darcy comes in, he plays two weeks down back. Then all of a sudden he's forward. So like, what what could have potentially been okay down back is now forward again. So there's a, yeah. You know, everyone just says, oh, well, yeah, the next year they get Liam Jones and, and they get they get Rory Lobb. They'll be they're going to have a great spine. I don't know. I mean, if this is the system, this is it's not it's not the individual breaking down. It's the system breaking down. So just because you throw another magnet there, they'll be abusing Liam Jones under this system next year, unmercifully. The the the, the Western Bulldogs fans, because you just can't you can't compete with this. So they've got, some, they've got a lot of work to do. You know, they've gone backwards at a rate of knots this year, which is really disappointing. Um, but they've still got this glut of midfield talent. What happens with Dunkley, I think, will be really significant for their fortunes going forward. And the last part of the Fremantle thing, I thought, in what they got right, uh, the Jai Amos selection oh. they got right, didn't they? What about Sonny Walters playing a game like that yeah. this far in? I wouldn't have, <laughs> I wouldn't have predicted that. And... and um, I sort of don't want to get but not having Tabiner there in the form that he's been in, they are a better look rather than defaulting to what they feel obliged to. I think they made good calls at selection. They get a nice result from it. So you've got to have selection integrity, don't you? As soon as you just pick players because you think they'll be okay or they'll turn or something will give, you lose control of your group. So the youngster coming in, oh, shit, hang on, he's prepared to play him instead of him. Wow. We better spike. You know, Sonny Walters probably thinks, hang on, I better, I better do a couple of things. Like some of the, you know, Frederick's chase on, on, yeah. on Ed Rich is just, it just, it's just next level. You don't see it with all, you didn't see it with the dogs, put it that way. Didn't mean as much to the dogs in the last three quarters as what it did to the Fremantle Dockers. And I think the crowd played their part in that yeah. too. They were just terrific. And that, so they knew that this is the bit that I love. So uh, there was a stage on Saturday where the Collingwood crowd, 
um, sort of took control of the environment. I thought that's such a – it's so incisive that a group of supporters know this is their moment to alter the environment of the game. And, and I thought the Fremantle crowd – it only took two goals. Yeah. So yeah. they were still uh, 30 – they went 40 – they, they were still 33 points down, but the environment of the game had changed and they played a role in that. But even even with ten, 10 minutes to go, eight minutes to go in the game, it was a goal. The gap, the gap was a goal. It felt like it was six goals. Oh, the but, game was over. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a strange feeling given that it was only one score. Kudos. In, I, I think that I, I don't want to talk about him too much, but huge opportunity now for Fremantle. Yeah, you know, the Collingwood would have had the disappointment, the, the um, unbelievable disappointment of the, the investment of the weekend, and I think this is why Craig McRae is really onto them to get over that quickly. Can Caleb Sarong come over and, and do do this again, and do what Lockie Neal has done for Brisbane and rip the heart out of a midfield that's I think gettable without Taylor Adams there now, the Collingwood midfield presents a little opportunity. Can, can they come and do it? Big opportunity for Freo now. Give it to us again. Sydney are going to be holding the Premiership Cup up, <laughs> holding it up. Air is going to be full of red and white streamers, and I'm going to be sitting there going. Well, I'm just not sure about this one. <laughs> <laughs> You've been constant with that. 16 weeks. I've gone back through my notes. I mean, 16. I just haven't been able to peg him. 16 weeks. Seedings? Four. My, mine are unchanged, which I think I had Collingwood at four. I'm Melbourne at four. Melbourne at four. Yep. Three. Melbourne. I've got Collingwood at three. So I liked Collingwood's game. I didn't really like Melbourne's game. Yeah, I didn't so, think it was that bad, but um, and then clearly no, no, not not that bad. I thought Collingwood were good. Okay, so I thought Collingwood were better in defeat than they have been in their narrow victories. Oh, okay. Whereas I thought Melbourne, they shrank in the face of the Sydney Challenge again. So to win it, they're going to have to get back through Sydney potentially. Yeah. Two and the health of them is a concern. Two is still Sydney. Yeah, two still Geelong. Still Geelong. Yep. Had Geelong at two for weeks. You've stuffed up your seedings every week, Jared. Who have you got at one? Yeah, Geelong. This is the this is awkward, nervous final they had to have. I thought they would have smashed Collingwood. In the end, they get over the line. No percentage in finals, Jared. You just tick a box, move on, miss a week, see you in the prelim. I've got Sydney at one. Sydney at one. You can't have Sydney. They were the best winner of the you weekend. You can't have Sydney at one. They were the best they winner come of the from weekend. Where? where were they officially on your one? Uh, day? Seven. <laughs> <laughs> he's just, no, Mark's convinced me. <laughs> so I'm putting them in at one. They can sit there. Just had a look back. You had Carlton at four, I think, the previous week. <laughs> Carlton and Richmond have been my seeded bogeys. I've dogs, overestimated the them the whole way through. Oh, I might have had them in as a wild card at one dogs. stage. <laughs> anyway, I've diligently left Sydney out. Now they're at one. Now they win it.